My girlfriend had just broken my heart. In one hour, I had to host the meeting of my life. Could I do it? Let me give you some background. Since early childhood, I had known my life's purpose. That's a special thing, but it can also be a bit of a burden, especially when one doesn't know how to get there. So at age 21, I was clear that certain things were needed, but totally unclear as to how to get there. And I stumbled onto this book in 1975, the book, The High Frontier, by Professor Gerard O'Neill, professor of physics, Princeton University. The High Frontier articulated a vision of a space program that could literally and figuratively empower the Earth. A space program that could permanently end poverty, scarcity, wars based on resource shortages, and open up new horizons and possibilities for humanity beyond most people's imagination. And yet, this was all based on solid science and engineering. None of this was fantasy. None of this was science fiction, except in the very hard sense of the term. I was captivated as I read this book. When I finished it, I will never forget this moment. I closed the book reverently, fell to my knees, tears streaming down my face, and begged God to use me however might be possible to help make this a reality for all of us. That was in 1975. I didn't feel worthy to reach out and try to become acquainted with Dr. O'Neill until 1984. In 1984, ladies and gentlemen, I was living in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the twin cities of Minnesota. <laughs> That's an authentic accent, by the way. And I received in the mail a curious solicitation from the Hubert Humphrey Institute, University of Minnesota. It said, in two weeks, they were going to host a symposium on living and working in outer space, with the keynote speaker being, drumroll, Dr. Gerard O'Neill. I had a decidedly mixed reaction to this. On the one hand, tremendous excitement that I could finally see my hero and hear him talk in person, and also trepidation. Why the heck am I learning about this two weeks in advance of it? I should be on everybody's short list for hearing months in advance. <laughs> Next day, I called them up. And I said, hi, how's it going? Yeah, how's the registration? The lady at the Humphrey Institute was so excited. She said, oh, it's going terrific. We've got 50 people signed up. <laughs> <laughs> I tried not to be impolite, but as I felt myself internally sagging, I swore a vow that I would do everything I could in those two weeks to make this a success. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I got off the phone. I called a couple of space advocacy organizations that I knew, described the situation, and said, give me the contacts of everybody in the Twin Cities. And then calling up people, I arranged a meeting at my home for two days later, which takes us back around to the beginning, because as it so happened, one hour before I was to host this, the woman I thought I was falling in love with, having been dating her for months, broke up with me in a very rude manner. And I was devastated. And with one hour to go, I realized something fundamental. There was something at stake here a heck of a lot more important than my feelings, my, what George Bernard Shaw would have called, petty concerns that, that drive us as biological organisms. I had a purpose. Somehow I roused myself off my behind and evinced tremendous enthusiasm and confidence at this meeting, even though I was breaking up inside. We just made our own rules. We had no time to get any permission from anybody. We took the flyer, we reworked it into a poster. We postered the Twin Cities. We went up and down the downtown areas and everything else we could get to. My personal life for those two weeks consisted of waking up in the morning, going to work, grabbing fast food as I could, and then postering and calling radio and TV, and then crashing for a few hours, usually about four, and then doing it again. The only thing that kept me going was sheer determination. 
the day of the event came, and I got in my car and I drove down with not a clue what I would be facing. I walked up to the registration desk and I said, how's it going? And she said, I don't know what's happening. The people are coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> we had seating capacity for 400 and we thought that would be enough. It's not. <laughs> they were pulling in seats into the, into the aisles outside the auditorium to have sufficient seating. That was the proudest moment of my life. After the event, I got the chance to meet Dr. O'Neill. I offered him a modest monthly donation to his nonprofit. And here's the serious physicist, this very formal, substantial person. All of a sudden, he changed like that. He took my hands in his, his eyes moist. He lovingly said, I didn't understand why $100 a month would have that kind of impact. I learned in the months that followed. He was dying of leukemia. He had only a couple years left. Instead of, like so many of us might do, retiring to spend time with his friends and family, Dr. O'Neill worked a punishing schedule traveling the world, meeting with world leaders speaking to people like us, to deliver and evangelize his message of a world set free from scarcity. I had the opportunity to help in other ways following that, but nothing ever touched my soul like the day I became worthy to meet my hero.